Hey everyone, it's George Crows with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I have my brother here today, mm-hmm. wow. Tony Sananis, a uh, very good friend of mine, very close. Uh, I actually feel I've known this guy forever, uh, but we've only known each other for a few years. Uh, he's like a brother to me. We've probably only seen each other maybe four or five times in person, but um, we were both started on Twitter quite a while ago and found out the other one's Greek. Yeah. And that was it. <laughs> That's it. And we talked. And so um, Tony is someone I love like family. Uh, he's very close to me. He's very close to my family, actually. And an amazing leader, amazing human being, amazing father. And I love watching um, his son grow up through social media. But even though his son will never hang out with me when I come to New York, but whatever. So Tony, <laughs> thanks for being here today, man. Can you just tell a little bit about yourself and who you are? Sure. Thank you very much, George, for having me. That's like the nicest introduction I've ever gotten. Well, it's true. It's all true, yeah, man. Because you're like family. It is true. Yep. And, uh, I will say, even though maybe Paul has yet to hang out with you, he does call you Uncle George anytime <laughs> your name comes up. Um, and he is prepared at some point to have a conversation with you about basketball. So that's, that's oh, coming. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Man, I should have him on the podcast <laughs> to talk about basketball. Oh, my God. He would love that. I would it? love a, bo- yeah. a basketball podcast. I'd love we're, that. We're going to make that happen. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, family, like I have no words to describe how I feel about you, but um, I am currently uh, an assistant superintendent for for human resources and leadership, and it's my 22nd year in education um, in New York, and so I've done everything from teaching at the elementary level to building principal to even superintendent, so it's been a really amazing and interesting journey, and I've learned so very much that has not only helped me be a better educator, I think, but a better dad and a better person, at least I hope so. Um, and I'm just really excited to keep doing what I love to do. I'm very, very blessed in that way. And one of the, Tony, one of the things I, I think we connected with, I think at the t- same time, I was either just leaving as a principal and I know you were currently a principal. I think we were principal yeah. at the same yeah. time. What, what was the, I cannot say that, I know the spelling, <laughs> but I can't say it. How do you say it's it? Candy Egg. Candy Egg. So yes. it's C-A-N-T-I-A-G-U-E. You got it. That's impressive. Yeah, I know how to spell it. I just don't know how to say it. (laughs) And so I actually remember um, you being there. And I think I had just left the principalship. And I just, every time I saw some of the stuff that you were doing, I missed it. And the really, like, just so focused on kids. And I, I, like, I had really good principals, but it was like kind of you only talk to them when you're in trouble, right? Yeah. And that was a shift. And one of the things that I, and I still show this to this day, um, you did this newsletter and mm-hmm. I show it and it was like Tony sitting in the middle of these kids and they're all talking and it was just so cool to see that. And so like, can you talk a little bit about, you know, kind of when you were a principal and some of the stuff that you're doing and just really, yeah. you know, how you always brought it back to kids. Cause it's just, that was always the stories you would share from that school. Um, and what I saw, that's what connected with me in the first place. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And truth be told, it was actually, you had the connected principal chat, the CP chat, right, and then there right. was the, the, the collaborative like blog uh, post area where, mm-hmm. where people were posting. That actually um, very much inspired me initially to learn and grow, right? You know, so I had been a principal for a couple of years at that point. Um, you know from the work, it's, it's as, even if you have an assistant principal, I did not have an assistant principal, mm-hmm. but even if you did, you still feel like you're kind of in a silo, right? You're, you're, kind of working in a singular fashion, if, even, even if you have a great organization around you. Um, and I started to connect with educators like you on social media, started to read blog posts, and it, it really informed my thinking. I, I, I feel like I was a pretty good manager. I was, I was good at like organizing stuff when I first started because I was super like um, OCD <laughs> and, and had to cross every T and dot every I. But then I started to, to connect with other leaders who were talking about student-centered work who were talking about voice and choice, who were talking about learning and maintaining a learner stance, like things that I had not even really thought about or considered. I, I, I almost, if I can capture it in a sentence, it would be that I went from leading in a transactional way where I just did the work and checked everything mm-hmm. off to beginning to lead in a relational way because I, I learned from people like you, um, you know, from Amber, from, from Joe, from Amy Fadeji, from Lynn Hilt, like so many people that mm-hmm. I connected with early on, uh, Joe Mazza, who, who reminded me and taught me about relationships. So in my work at Caniag, initially, I think it was still transactional. I started reading, I started learning, and, and I just brought people to the center of the work, right? My, our teachers, 
our families and our kids because everything we were doing was for our kids. Our, our work there was to serve them and to provide them with the best access to learning possible, um, but to also make it joyful and fun and something that they look forward to doing when they get to, you know, when they wake up in the morning and they get to school. Um, and so the, the newsletter was born from, this video newsletter was born mm -hmm. from, how do we connect our families? So not just, not just engage them to come out for a bake sale or to, to contribute to the latest fundraiser, but how do, we, how do we engage them in the learning? How do we let them know, let them in on what it is that we're doing? What are first graders learning about? What are they excited about? Um, and instead of writing a newsletter, which I had done for years, I thought, well, how do we bring some voice to that? And what's cuter than a bunch of kids, it, even if it was right. just picture form, right? And, and we started trying it out and it just took off and the kids really drove it forward. They were excited to, to tell the stories. They were excited to interview teachers about what they were doing so they could talk about it on our little video newsletter. Um, and we went from an email, right, that had an overview, like a newsletter email that probably got maybe 100 views to these video newsletters that were getting 500 views, 700 views, 1,000 views. Um, and our kids were loving it. So it just an idea that was born, I think, from the PLN. I, I can't take credit for it. I remember where, but somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then we brought it to Kaniag and really put the kids at the center of it. And then they owned it and they drove it forward. And it just became a really powerful vehicle for connecting with the, with the community, engaging our families, but also like amplifying our, our students' voices and, and keeping them at the center of the story. Well, when, when I first saw it, I was just blown away and thought it was absolutely incredible. And, and it, like I saw it because it was on YouTube, right? Like it was yeah. public. Anyone could see it. The, before I kind of, I'm going to ask you something about that. But one of the things I, I heard you say that was really interesting, it was really kind of, you were more um, focused, not necessarily focused, but just the, you, you all do all the nuts and bolts, right? Yeah. Yep. And I'm listening to you and I'm like, I was the exact opposite. Like I had no <laughs> idea what I was doing, but people are like, he's good with people. So like, let's see if you can figure this stuff out. Right. Cause yeah, I was yeah. like, God, I don't know what I'm doing, but you know, as long as people see, I like kids, they'll probably give me a break. <laughs> right. Yes. And so it's kind of funny cause I feel like our journeys, but it's interesting because I know that you've always been a very like relationship focused mm -hmm. person. Right. And I, I was just thinking as I'm talking to you, I cannot remember a time that I didn't feel you and I were super close. Like it was like, I saw you and boom, we just became very connected because we had so much in common or, you know, our yeah. family stories. Yeah. Um, but the, the one thing when you, when you talk about that video and it being on YouTube, right. And especially with, yeah. you know, people are terrified of people posting stuff online right now. And you know, everyone's working online. I find it really fascinating that a lot of people that have made names for themselves uh, actually don't want kids using technology, which I'm like, do you know how you made a name for yourself is because you're sharing <laughs> through this stuff, right? Are you, do you want to take that away from kids? And I, when you first did that video, like when you first started putting that out there and it was like open to the world, what was the response of like, were your families like, yay, or were there some of them super terrified? No, the collective was a yay. Um, I will, I will, I will tell you. People were excited about it. I started getting emails from parents. They're like, "When is my kid get, gonna get to be in the, you know, the video update?" And totally, uh, it's, you know, she she wants to do this or she wants to try that. And 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 the whole journey around it evolved, like even week to week. I mean, there were weeks that we featured books that kids wanted to read because I had kids who wanted to talk about a book or or, or uh, their favorite activity in the school beyond just what was going on. I love to do this, and it all came from our kids. Now. Were there some people that were a little nervous about kids being featured? Yeah. So we were mindful. We never shared last names, right? Like I never mm -hmm. said the address of, of where we were. Granted, we said our school name. Right. Um, but we were really mindful of that. And it was always choice. And our families, if they didn't want their children on, on social media, whether that was YouTube or Twitter, they mm -hmm. let us know. And we were super respectful of that. But in my eight years as principal there, George, and at least five of them, we were actively leveraging social media. We never had one problem. Like kids didn't make bad choices about how they were using mm -hmm. social media. We didn't have anyone do anything nasty or inappropriate in response to anything we shared. And so I think that allowed it to grow because we didn't approach it from a mindset, at least I didn't approach it from a mindset of let's establish all these rules that we're going to follow first and then try to do it. We, we really just tried to do it. And then as issues came up, which sometimes they did, we just established some guidelines or, or some parameters or some mm -hmm. frameworks to be thinking about. But broadly, it was working and what what happened that blew everyone's mind was then we started to connect with kids 
from schools across the country and across the world. Like mm-hmm. we did, you know, Brad Gustafson I met because we were right. doing videos and he, he, his kids and John Fritzke, who is a principal in New Jersey and his kids, all three of our kids groups did like video updates together. We did book talks together. That came out of that. Like that was because we were open and we shared and, and we put kids at the center of the story and their enthusiasm is, is infectious, right? Um, and so we connected with schools in like Iceland. Um, we connected with a school in, wow. um, in Asia that was looking to do, it was an international school, but they were looking to do something similar. And I'll tell you right now, George, like it was for me always about, this is how my kids did this, right? Like all I did mm-hmm. was hold the iPad totally. and I, I yeah. created the space, right? For them to do it. Um, and it was great. But I think there's a, I think there's actually, and I, I talk about this, there was, it was you in the middle and there was a symbolism to parents like, Hey, I, I'm right with your kids. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. I, I got them. Don't worry yeah. about it. Right. Yeah. And the, as I'm listening to you, when I work with parents on this stuff, I, I like, and everyone knows this, we, we do these nights talking about some of this stuff. And then you have a parent who's just waiting to jump on everything you're doing. <laughs> and so I actually started to be proactive about it. And I say, okay, I want to know that everyone like agrees with me here before I even start on. And this is how I built this presentation site. First of all, we want to keep your kids safe. Do you agree with me? hundred percent. Second of all, we want to ensure that every door is open for your child to be successful in our world today. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Of course I do. And so my contention is that a lot of the practices that we're doing are not actually doing either of those things because when we ignore it, you're not keeping your kids safe. You're just saying not my problem. Yeah. But when you're, list, when you're listing off all of the things that were happening um, through that process, you're opening up these doors for kids that they're probably blown away and their families are blown away by, right? And I, yeah. I think that, that to me is amazing. And I remember showing, Tony, I remember showing um, your video <laughs> to a group of principals. Yeah. And I'll never forget this. I can actually remember, I won't say where I was, but I remember where I was <laughs> and what school district I was working with. And I showed the video and I remember one principal saying to me, hey, that's cool for you. And your community might be cool with that, but my parents are never going to be comfortable with that. And I actually said, you know what? I guarantee, and you actually said it, it's funny. I guarantee you can find five parents in your community that are fine with it. And you know what's going to happen the next week? People are going to say, when is my kid in that video? Mm-hmm. That's right. When's my kid going to be in, right? <laughs> and so that, that to me, when you're, when you're sharing that, it is so powerful because you're seeing these parents and I, I remember showing your video to a night at parents yeah. and I said, and the teacher's like, our parents can be freaked out by this. And I showed, I said, how many of you would rather this as your newsletter as opposed to this? And a hundred percent of parents in the hand and the, and the teacher's like, what? Yes. Like, we thought they were terrified. We didn't want to do this. And I think we actually take for granted that for maybe sometimes there's that one or two parents. And then we actually take it away from the, the 99% that, you know, want that opportunity, right? That's it. Like it, it, what I've learned is don't work from the deficit mindset, right. work from the opportunity mindset. And so even if, even if it's only 1% of parents who are willing to try it and start with those families. And, and we, I mean, listen, we tried it as like a, uh, just on a whim, like, all right, let's do this. Let's see what happens. And I remember one of the first, <laughs> one of the first videos we shot, the kids were like behind me, we were trying to figure out how to hold the iPad. At one point they're like leaning on my chair, my chair flipped over. <laughs> Mm-hmm. No, we didn't catch the recording of that. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I also know plenty of principals that would have been like, all right, forget it. We can't do this. Now. But we just sat on the floor instead of the next one. Like it wasn't, we weren't going to use the desk or whatever. Um, and, and, and in the end, you know what? What it brought me closer to my kids. And I love my kids. Don't get mm-hmm. me wrong. And they, they knew me. I was always in the hallway. I was always at recess. I was always walking around. But these moments that we had to just connect and laugh and talk and share the story of our school, like spotlight the things that they were doing, just change the dynamic between me and them. Like it was, it was almost as if they saw me as a peer in in a really appropriate, Mm -hmm. mature way. Right. Like, and they, they felt elevated um, and they felt ownership over our school. Like Candy Ag wasn't about Tony being the principal or, you know, Allison being the teacher or Laura being the administrative assistant in, in, in the office. It was about Ben, the kindergartner who was so excited to talk about what he learned that week because that was his school. And, and I'll tell you, George, it was like crystallized for me when we were doing kindergarten orientation. So our incoming kindergarten kids would come so we could get to know them. We did a little read aloud and uh, we did a little bit of an assessment. I remember one year, uh, a little girl, her name was Belle. I'll never forget it. She was four. I had never met her before. I walked into the lunchroom to pick up these four-year-olds to take him in for orientation. And she was like, Tony, 
I've been waiting to meet you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, okay, hi, Belle, who are you? I was like, who are you? She said, I'm Belle. I said, hi, Belle. I said, how do you know my name is Tony? She's like, oh, I watch your videos every week. You're Tony Sinanis, you're the lead learner. And you know, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I can hear you say that and, too. Yeah, and, and she said, she's like, I have been waiting to come to my big girl school for a year. Like she already saw it as her school. That's awesome. Right, and that to me was like enough said about why it's important to do mm -hmm. it, whether we connected with other people or not. What we did is we gave our kids ownership over this, this space in this community, and they knew that they were at the center of it. They knew that they were drivers in where we were going and what we were doing. And, and that's profound in my mind, and I, you know, I'm blown away by it still. And that, that, that ownership is like, as I'm listening to you, that's the, that actually was the word that keeps popping up in my mind. And I make this really simple analogy. So when you have like, when schools, and I don't know how many schools have this still, they have a computer lab, you know, we're so, you know, terrified of kids using computers. One of the things that you would see all the time, and I'm sure you saw this in your career, is kids would like go on those keyboards and they'd pop the keys out, right? So who cares? It's not mine. It's not my problem. Right. But when you actually have kids with their own devices, they don't like, oh, I'm going to feel like popping out the keys of my own device I have to take care of, right? You're right. Because when it's mine, yeah. when, when it's mine, there, I have more pride in it. I have mm -hmm. more ownership. I want to take care of it. But when it's just I'm here as, you know, a temporary guest, then That's what right. do I care, right? And I, I think right. you did such a good job with that. The, and I know your role, your, your associate superintendent, is associate superintendent? Assistant associate. Assistant associate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I was able to join your school district and I could just feel, you know, just tons of love and, and care. And I know one of the things that you've been really focused on as of late, and I don't technically, and I, I don't know what your super so assistant superintendent of, right? maybe <laughs> the assistant resources. superintendent of love, of, yeah. <laughs> of, you know, of caring, right? I Which is that. kind of hu human resources, yeah. right? I like that. But I know that you've had a real big focus on, you know, mental health and mm -hmm. wellness and I know you've, you've done a lot of things from a personal standpoint, um, but also from a district standpoint. So can you just kind of talk a little, a little about with that? Yeah, sure. No, I think one of the other things that I've, I've had the privilege to learn from the brilliant people that I'm surrounded by, like you and other members of the PLN and even at work, was the, the notion of emotional safety and knowing that when we create emotionally safe spaces, that's when people can access the learning. That's when people can engage at high you know, level, collaborative, critical thinking opportunities. But when we lead with that, when we lead with the learning or, or the, the curriculum, and we don't take the time to establish emotionally safe spaces, there's a disconnect. And that's where we lose kids. That's where we lose staff members. And so the, the idea of wellness and, and self-care um, and mental health, um, which is something that I, I I'm aware of every single day of my life. You know, I, I have to check myself to make sure that I stay in a positive frame of mind. I, I go for the run in the morning so I can clear my head and make room for the ice cream I want to have later. Um, I'm learning to cook with my, my partner and my son because, you know what, we can't go out. <laughs> we can't go out, but because it's good quality time. And so recently I communicated with our staff uh, just a few updates that I had to share with them. But the first thing I wrote was, I just I want you to know as your assistant superintendent for HR, I'm not only here for hiring and recruiting and for medical leaves, I am here for people. And my job is all about relationships and caring for the people that are in our organization. And so I wanna support that. I wanna make sure that you feel cared for and you feel valued and you feel emotionally safe, right? And I put that in writing, but then I also tried to model it and I, I use social media to, I use the hashtag CHAP self-care because we're in Chappaqua. Mm -hmm. And um, I share little bits, whether it's a run that I went for, whether it's that my mom that I saw from a distance, whether it's my son mm -hmm. and I baking cookies, because that balance, that self-care is critical for balance so that I can engage in the work and, and be my best self as the assistant superintendent, right? And so that's, that's always been a priority for me, but very much so right now, especially in light of the pandemic that we're dealing with. Right. But even if this wasn't going on, I, I feel like it's imperative that our educators take care of themselves and model that for our kids because sustainability is critical, right? We're, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And we need to be able to take care of ourselves so we can take care of others. Um, and so, so that's very much been on my, on my mind and in, at the forefront of my work. And the thing that is really incredible about you, Tony, and the work that you do is through those spaces, you feel, you help people feel really connected to you as a human being. You're very open of, 
you know, who you are as a person. And I'm just going to share two stories about you quick, Tony. Oh. I was having one of the darkest days of my life and I text you and you helped me. And so I just want to like, I always get other people crying my podcast, so I don't want to do it myself. But I just remember that. And like, it's funny because you and I will actually not talk for six months. And then it's like, we, it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. Like we always pick up. And of all the people in the world, I reached out to you and you helped me. And I just will never forget that and how important that was. And part of the reason was I actually, when we started talking, you called my mom. Mm -hmm. And because you can speak Greek, anyone that speaks Greek to her is like the best thing ever, right? And I just remember that. And so I think you call, I don't know how many times you talked to her. I think you have like Several. a... Yeah, so the thing that um, always, whenever I talk to her, she'll say, how's Tony doing? And she'll check her. She's never met you. And it was just like, and so just, just really appreciate you, man. So I just well, want to, I, I, <laughs> I was going to ask I, you. But yeah, I, go ahead. I have to say to you that, um, you know, I went through a difficult time in my life when I was coming to terms with my sexuality, which was, you know, a, a challenging situation because I come from a really traditional, wonderful, but traditional family and world. Um, and there were certain people that I felt safe with just kind of opening up because, and not that I was embarrassed about it, but I was just nervous about how people would respond and react. Um, and you were one of the people that always made me feel like, it's okay. And that doesn't, you know, I don't care if you're gay, if you're straight, if you like banana cream pie or not, like <laughs> it never became, it never became a thing. Right. It was, it was always about a connection and you saw me the person and yeah. not, not me, the white man or the, or the gay man or the whatever. It was just this connection yeah. at, at, at the heart, I feel like. And um, you don't know how much that means to me because yeah. I know that there are people who, um, you yeah, know, who, who have their own challenges and their own struggles and so when, when you meet someone who's compassionate and empathetic and will carry you when you can't carry yourself, um, it's, it's life-changing. And, and, um, and you've done that for me. And I am, am, am privileged to, to call you my friend and my brother and to share that with you. And, um, and I feel very lucky to be surrounded by some amazing educators who I see have done the same for me and each other, but also for our students. And, and, and that's the work, like, that's it. Like, that's what yeah. we want humanity, right. And, and treating people with, with, with kindness, but not just kindness with empathy and with compassion. Um, because it literally can be the difference between life and, and, and yeah. not, you know, and, and so you don't know how much your presence has meant to me Thanks, in my world during a difficult time. Um, and just to be, to be comfortable in my own skin. That's, that's, we take it for granted, but it's such a huge thing. And so I thank you for that. The, so the thing is, I'm listening, this is the same thing that we want for kids. Like, yeah. it's, it's not the idea of kids being accepted for who they are. It's the kids being loved for who they are. That's right. Right? That's right. That's it's right. a totally different, like, and maybe I'm off in my terminology, but that's what, you know, we want for every that's single kid we interact with. And, you know, so I appreciate yeah. that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop doing cry stories. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. This is, this is the this is no the, more Greek, crying. the Greek yeah. emotional in us. <laughs> yes. Um, you you wrote a book. <laughs> I can't take it anymore. It's like I started I started tearing up listening to you before I even started talking too. Uh -huh. And I'm like, oh geez, I should bring this up because I'm not ready. So, um, you wrote a book uh, with our good friend Joe Sanfilippo, who yes. who I will. I tell him I love him all the time. He's an awesome guy, but uh, I also give him a hard time, and I know you do too. And he's he's a great guy. And it's called Hacking Leadership. So can you talk a little bit about your book? Let me just start by saying, Joe Sanfilippo. He may be a good guy, but he is a huge pain in the behind. Um, and I would agree with that. Okay, and for a cricket, it doesn't end. It's like a constant thing. It's like there's always something we got to say <laughs> in a text message or in a in a yeah. picture. I'm like, leave me alone. I, I might block him on my phone. I'm just saying, um, no, yeah, Joe and That's I, awesome uh, <laughs> he is, let me tell you something. There are a few people who I know that I could talk to no matter what is going on. And I'm going to laugh and smile and feel better about whatever's going on than Joe. Um, another person who just like speaks from the heart 
leads with the heart and puts mm -hmm. other people before himself. And I mean, he, he is, he is my best friend. I mean, I, I, I know I can go to him with anything and he will always be there to support me or, or give me mm -hmm. feedback or help me figure something out as it relates to our book. Um, you know, we had the opportunity to write this book. It was about four years ago now. And, um, we, 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 I remember we talked about it on the phone. We were like, all right, we got to come up with 10 hacks because that's the structure to the, to yeah. the book. And uh, what are the things that we want to write about? And everything we wrote about, everything we wrote about came back to relationships, putting kids at the center, um, adult passion projects, eradicating the deficit mindset, um, telling the story. So you put, you know, it's all about relationships and kids. And I was excited to contribute to it. I didn't know if it was going to resonate with other leaders. And, and quite honestly, I almost didn't care because it was just so important to, to spotlight the things that we felt were, were important and mattered most to kids in education. Um, and then to see the way people responded to it and the way people still respond to mm -hmm. it is, is pretty awesome. It's not, you know, we didn't, it's not a research based book. It's not, you know, some dense, heavy stuff. It's nothing earth shattering, but it is written by two people who love what they do, who live what they do and are excited to share it. Um, and hope to only create those opportunities for the people they work with and the kids that they serve. And so, that was a privilege. And if I never do anything again professionally, that is definitely something that I'm, I'm proud of. Like, like being Paul's dad is probably the most proud thing that I am in my life. But writing that book, I felt like was a labor of, <laughs> of love. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of what we produced. Yeah. And, and both of you are amazing at what you do and you, you live it and been able to see it. I, I feel when, when I was able to, um, see you in action uh, when I came to visit your school district, I felt a lot like my dad at the restaurant in the way that you connected with people. Like I just, it was so uh, reminiscent of that. And I just, I just loved it. Um, right now, you know, people are, um, I, I feel like we're, we're in the middle of May right now. Mm -hmm. And even with the anxiety of like all the pandemic stuff, you're in New York state, you know, mm -hmm. obviously one of the hardest hit places in the world. Yeah. Yep. Right. And I felt that at the beginning of the stuff, kind of middle of March, and we're kind of two months in, mm -hmm. as, as much as there was this fear, there was like this excitement, like we're off to action. Yeah. And people were, you know, exhausted, but doing all these really incredible things, and they're still doing this. Mm -hmm. But I feel that that rush has kind of come down. Yeah. And now it's like, okay, this is, this is reality for a while. <laughs> like, it's like, it was like, Hey, I can do this for a couple of weeks. And it's like, yeah. Oh, like a month. You're right. like, okay, <laughs> couple months? Like maybe into next year. And I feel it's like this, this, this kind of lag period. Mm -hmm. So how are you, like, how are you working with people to kind of deal with this? And maybe, and maybe I'm totally, maybe that's just no. my experience. Right. You're, so you're how right. are you helping people during that right now? You're, you're hundred percent on point. Um, for me, even I'm, I'm experiencing it myself and I've heard it from colleagues, teachers and other, and other administrators and leaders. And what we talk about is, all right, let's just break it down almost by the hour. Like mm -hmm. we need to then just compartmentalize it, focus on the small victories that we have and recognize that we're not going to revolutionize education because of a pandemic, but we're going to sustain to the best of our ability. We're going to sustain positive student-centered learning environments, even from a distance, and that's mm -hmm. going to be priority, right? So it's, it's and, and yes, are we revolutionizing education in some way, shape, or form? Yes, I don't mean to, you know, disregard the outcomes of what this is, as it relates to our profession and our craft, but the people piece is, is what's driving that. And so we, we've talked a lot about how we can break it down and chunk it into what feels manageable. Also, validate that we may be feeling a lag, that we may be feeling overwhelmed, that we are not sure if we could do this for another six months if this goes into next year. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to do that then? And one of the, one of the things that, we, that I've been thinking a lot about is I have a colleague, she's an assistant principal in our district, super smart. And she recently said to me, kind of what you're talking about, she's like, we started, we were all pumped or excited. She's like, but in the end, people are going to remember how we end, not how we started. So how are we going to wow. make sure that we end well? Right. And, and she's right. I don't want to see people collapse at the finish line, if you will. Right. I want to see people get through the finish line. They're going to be tired. They're going to be exhausted, but they're going to be pumped because of what they accomplished and because of what they could do moving forward. So for me, it's about finding that spot where people feel like they're, they're going to finish. 
they may be hurting a little when they finish, but they're going to be, they're going to be empowered by what they accomplish because what they accomplish is nothing short of extraordinary. I mean, we literally launched online schools in, in days mm -hmm. and, and teachers who, who were nervous about technology or who lived in, in places where the internet is not strong. I mean, I live in a community where our, our internet is kind of shoddy at home. It is what it is. Um, they were like, we're going to make it work. So if I need to go sit right next to the router <laughs> or if I need to wake up at the crack of dawn so I can record videos for my kids or if I need to stay up late, whatever it is, we're going to do it. Um, and so now we have to make sure that we sustain ourselves because we cannot allow ourselves to collapse under the pressure of what is a lag, you know? And, and, and so that's about having open conversations. That's about chunking experiences so you don't see the next month and a half, just see the next hour, just see the next day. And then also making a point of celebrating the things that have gone well and, and acknowledging those things and relying on them. And, and the last thing we've talked about recently is how can we crowdsource resources and ideas and, and activities and learning you know, units of study like as a collective, instead of feeling like we have to burden it, you know, mm -hmm. carry the burden individually, because you don't. If you're a strong first grade teacher, there are other strong first grade teachers out there. How can you partner with them? How can you share resources and ideas with them so you're not always recreating the wheel? Um, so th those have been some of the, the sort of talking points, if you will, that we've been thinking about, that I've been thinking about um, at work now to get us through, because we have another, we have like another six weeks before school is out. We go till right. June 26th, it's late. So we need to finish strong and hopeful. And I think the, the, the focus that I've seen from you in the work is we want people to do amazing work, Yeah. but you can't do it if you're not okay. Mm -hmm. And if you're not taking care of yourself, right? Because I think a lot of people and in education, we are notoriously bad for this. Mm -hmm. We will go to the detriment of our own health um, to serve yes. kids. And that's okay. Like that will have, that will work for a little bit, but it always catches up every mm -hmm. single time. Like it might be a month. It might be two, it might be 10 years, yeah. but it always catches up. And so you have to be proactive in, in that space because ultimately when you do take care of yourself, it's not a selfish thing. It's that's so right. you can better serve. That's right. right. So you can better serve others. Tony, any last thoughts, any actually what's, what is your like best piece of advice for people right now? It's what you just said. Make sure you take care of yourself. Make sure you create time to take care of yourself because there is no way you can care for your family, for your students, for your colleagues if you're not in a good place. And, and taking care of yourself can mean whatever it means for you. For me, it's going for a run in the morning. For others, it might be sitting in a, in a quiet spot and, and reflecting in a journal. For someone else, it might be yoga. For someone, it might be talking to a family friend. But make sure you take care of yourself. I think that is, is paramount and we can't get lost in everything that's going on around us because there's so much we can't control. So control that because you can carve out that time for yourself. And every single day, I think this is important. Make time to connect with someone that makes you smile, mm -hmm. right? So whether it's your mom, whether it's your, your brother, George, whether it's your, your own kid, and it may be a different person on any given day, but take five minutes to just connect with that person, maybe check in on that person, but even selfishly, because you know that person is going to make you smile and make you feel better. Um, listen, George, I don't necessarily love to do podcasts because sometimes I feel like I can't connect with the person that I'm talking to because I don't, may not know them. But with mm -hmm. you, when you, it was an honor to be asked to be part of this. I knew that no matter what the conversation was, I know I was going to be done and I was going to be smiling. So selfishly, this was time <laughs> that I carved out because it was going to feel good for me. So that's what I think about. Thanks, man. I, well, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate all you do. I'm so proud of you in so many ways. And, you know, um, your family is like my family. So please give my best to Felix. I I'm will. expecting, um, is, <laughs> is Paul, is he watching um, The Last Dance? We are, we are watching it, yes. So then, you know what would be awesome? Him and I should do a podcast because I would love, because this is all... I've seen this before, right? I like, know, I, I, I know. This. And I'm just like, would be fascinated. <laughs> it's like, this has got to be new to him, right? He's loving it. Yeah, it's totally oh. new. And he's, he's like in awe. Every, every time, we, we're only on like episode okay. five, maybe. But every time we end it, he's like, I didn't know that happened. Like, where did that, you know? I'm like, I didn't even know either. Yeah. I lived it. I was there. I would love that. He would love that. It, it, um, would, it would actually, like, it's funny because he is going, living it 
basically at the same age I was when it happened the first time. That's right. right? Which That's is right. so cool to think <laughs> it's about. amazing. Well, I love you, brother. So thanks for too. being on the podcast and uh, make sure you connect with Tony. Um, it's Tony Sinanis at right I, on Twitter yeah, because right, yeah. I made you change it. <laughs> you did. You did. <laughs> you did. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I love you, man. I hey, love you too. Thanks Thank for listening you. to the podcast. Tony, hope you have a wonderful day. Give my best to your family. Give my you best too, to your sir. parents too, okay? You too, sir. Thank right. you. Love you, bro. Love you too, man. Thank you.